You're listening to Innovative Minds with Melanie Francis, where we talk to some of the top thought leaders, business leaders, and marketers around the globe. Tune in every Thursday and spark your mind. And now, let's get into it. Hello, and welcome back to Innovative Minds Podcast. Today, I have with me Paul O'Brien from, he's the CEO of Media Tech Ventures. He is part of the startup ecosystem, the venture system, and he connects all those dots together. But I will be asking him this because I've been exploring him for a while now. And hey, Paul, nice to have you. What is Media Tech? Thank you so much. Uh, it's great to be here, I, and and what a wonderful place to start. Uh, the the tech side of every industry, a- any industry, from travel to hospitality to to finance, it's the tech side that causes change and creates opportunity. And in the media industries, uh, we seem to have lost sight of how quickly tech creates new opportunities and how quickly it changes things. We we don't teach people. Uh, quickly enough and efficiently enough and effectively enough what the technology is doing to social media or or the film industry or or the music business or, or the news industry. And because of that, we see a lot of the challenges and struggles that people go through. And so media tech is is the convergence of those two and that focus on the media industry and the technology they're in. Awesome. So when you talk about media, would we say then Netflix, Meta, uh, LinkedIn, are these all forms of their social media? What about other media forms, movies? Do, we, do you kind of encompensate all of those? We believe you must. That, that, about 30 years ago, a group of economists pointed out that the only things that really create value in business are marketing, which is by an extent of, of marketing includes media, and innovation, the, the technology side. And, and so when we started looking at what we could do for the media industry about seven, eight years ago, I found it remarkable that different parts of the world think of the word media in different ways. That if you say media in Los Angeles, uh, they tend to think it's the entertainment business. If you say media in, uh, in London or in Europe, they tend to think it's the news industry uh, or the advertising industry. And, and the reality of, of that word is that it encompasses all of that. It's the written word. It's the spoken word. It's an advertisement. It's, it's the, the creative content that communicates information is media. And that includes everything from video games to podcasts to, to news and Netflix. What I saw something cool in the media recently, I don't know if you've seen it, but um, because you mentioned the movie industry, Ryan Reynolds, I think, has got his own media company where he produces fun ads as a celebrity and he's created a media company doing that. And I guess he's trying to empower other celebrities. Like, you know, why would celebrities do ads? And, but he's turned it around. I thought that was super innovative and creative for a celebrity to turn it around. We're, we're seeing it even in that more extreme with something like Cameo, where uh, if you visit the Cameo website, you can, you can hire a, a celebrity for a hundred dollars or 200 uh, U.S. and 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 send a birthday uh, greeting to a friend of yours. That that yeah, truly media media is a good example of how and where we're really changing the way that businesses and creators and entrepreneurs can can make money. And Ryan Ryan's a great example of that, having shifted from being an actor to 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 being in a liquor company. He's in an alcohol company that that is tremendously successful because of his talents in front of a camera. I know it's it's amazing what media can do. What well. In media, right, over the seven years or over the course of that you have, you know, seen media growing up, how would you say it's changed and how would you say it's actually even stayed pretty much the same in many ways? That is a question we could unpack throughout an entire show because many of us argue that media hasn't changed at all. To give an extreme example, so social media is what is what people in villages did sitting around the campfire thousands of years ago, right? Social media is nothing more than sharing news and gossip and, and, and having a conversation. And, and it's what technology has done that has changed our impression of how we have conversations. Uh, media is, is 
animated content, the, the, the video, the, the film. And, and that too is, has changed through technology. It's gone from the film strip or film strip to the, the digital forms of media that we create today. Uh, photography, of course, has changed over, over the years, how that's produced and, and distributed. So, so it really is an interesting question as to whether or not media actually has changed uh, and, and whether or not media does change. I, I'm on the side of the fence that it does not change. Uh, that media is the exact same thing it's always been. It's the technology that's changed. Now, however, you say that to most people, and they can't quite make the leap from a newspaper to a website, and and they can't quite necessarily appreciate how a newspaper and how that was printed in the printing press should have or has the same considerations about free speech and advertising and subscriptions and readership as a website does today. Uh, they're actually not that different, uh, how they're created, how they manifest is what's different. And so there is a challenge of, of teaching people that at the end of the day, media is not that different than it always has been in that people get left behind. People, people get concerned about uh, free speech issues or, or, or stealing information or stealing data or, uh, or privacy rights on the internet because they don't really understand what, what's changed is how the technology works and what the technology does to us and for us through the media. I really like the concept you said, so it's everyone sitting around the fireplace, you know, back in the tribal days, sharing gossip, but now it's hard to find your tribe because there's so many people all over the world and you really are looking for that tribe, aren't you? In in how you want to socially engage, you're looking for your own tribe of people that you connect with, you're like-minded with, you and I like together now sharing because we kind of care about maybe similar things and want to converse over similar things. Just differently because right now we don't we're not sitting in a tribe in a fireplace anymore but we're sitting across different countries but we still want to connect with similar people and that's that's from where that that notion exists that media has not changed uh that that in a lot of discussions and debates that we have with uh governments country governments uh about the question of privacy we'd like to point out that privacy is a human invention Privacy is something that the internet helped create, that, that a thousand years ago, you did not have privacy. Pri- privacy didn't exist. That, that when you would, that you would socialize what you're doing in your, in your village, uh, it wouldn't take long before everyone knew. Uh, everyone knew if you were sick. Everyone knew who you liked and didn't like. Everyone knew that you were having a child. It, it, that, that privacy is a, a creation of the password on, on the internet. And it's a creation of a, a more private account that you might set up on a, on a Facebook or, or a Twitter. The, the reality is there is no privacy. Uh, and, and, that, and that reminder of how we used to live and that the technology is what created an, an impression of privacy is what now created a society in which politicians are promising that they'll make sure the, the internet is secure and private for you. And people are concerned about privacy on the internet. The reality is it's the same as it always has been. When I say something in front of my friends or I put it up on Twitter, the fact is it's out in the world and it's no longer private information. So so what is your view then on censorship and the whole saga of Elon Musk and Twitter brought out a lot of discussion around censorship further? Not that it, it's been a discussion for some time with, you know, Google being major censorship. And um, so what is your view on censorship at the moment like what what should, what must be done what must be like left alone where are your thoughts on that that's a great question because it's it's a good example too of the challenge of ignorance of the technology and and the pace at which technology changes things causing people to get frustrated and concerned and and and, and determined to to do something to fix the way things are that that when it comes to uh how people define the internet in the last five years. If you were to ask most people, they'll, they'll tell you that the internet is Facebook. They'll tell you that the internet is TikTok, uh, which, which isn't remotely correct. The internet is and continues to be hundreds of millions of different domains and websites and properties and, and forums and discussion groups. And, and, and you can start your own right now uh, at, at no cost and, and be live with your own form of social media by tomorrow morning. Right. Which which is important to appreciate because the answer has to be the answer has to be because of that, that we must teach people. We must show people that censorship is only something that governments can do to us. Censorship is only something that that 
an entity empowered to enforce a law against you, if, if someone can fine or imprison you for your words, that's censorship. Uh, companies can't censor. Companies are private property. LinkedIn has every right, uh, TikTok has every right to decide what or what is not allowed on their property. And, and, and because we don't realize that anymore, we don't, we don't like that, or, or we don't appreciate that, you know, if I don't like Facebook, I can go over to Nextdoor, or I can go over to Reddit, or I can go, you know, there are thousands of alternatives. Because society has lost track of how the internet actually works, we've gotten really frustrated with these ideas of, of privacy and security and, and censorship. And indeed, you know, as we saw, Elon Musk took some good advantage of that uh, in, in both positive and negative ways. And, and I think it, it was, in many respects, uh, actually an intentional decision on his part to ruffle some feathers, to, to create some attention for, for what he thinks about and what he's working on, and, and probably to get some support for some other things by disrupting how we know and think about what Twitter is. You're right. At, at the end of the day, these platforms have their own platforms within the internet and they themselves can dictate what they're comfortable with and how they want their platforms to work. Um, it's just some of them, some of these platforms have such massive amount of people, you know, so if you want to gossip or if you want to share around this fire that we were talking about, it seems like, you know, some of these fires lie within these platforms which have censorship. Um, attached to them so it's you know where we connect in media right now where we talk in media I mean that's why we can come offline to places like this and I guess there is no censorship now because we've taken ourselves off those platforms and creating our own content and then I guess you can get away from it but still to get this content heard there is platforms that have huge reach and then they place censorship Onto us, I guess. I don't think it's appropriate to say that they place censorship on us. They they moderate their content. They they pay for the development, and the operation of their platform, of their website. I run a number of websites. I, I have my own website at at SEO Brian. I have my own website. I guarantee you, I'm not going to allow people to say whatever they want on my website. There is there is a comment section. You you technically are able to say what you want, but it doesn't mean I have to let you, right? And 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 the village analogy is still wonderful because, you know, if you if you if you take it a step further, when we leave the campfire, and I go into my, I don't know, my tent or my hovel, whatever we had thousands of years ago, I, I don't have to permit you to come in and say whatever you want, right? That is that is mine. And that's the distinction, the important distinction between censorship. It's, it's when we're sitting around that fire and the village elder says, Melanie, you are not allowed to say such a thing. We're going to put you in stocks, right? We're going we're gonna to imprison you for saying such a thing around our, around our campfire, that we have a serious problem, that we have a real problem. And the right way to overcome these challenges is not debating censorship or free speech of the government and, and private property. It's, in fact, education. It's, it's reminding people about what it means to trust but verify. <laughs> I, I read something on the internet. Great. Does that mean it's true? No. <laughs> I, I don't care who the source was. I don't care if the source is the Wall Street Journal. If you read something on the internet, what should you do about it? You should go look and confirm whether or not it's true through research, through other discussions. Again, nothing has changed. But because society now believes technology will protect us and, and Reddit can only do good things and right things and the government's going to save us from, from things that are wrong or erroneous or mistaken, people think that whatever I see online, it, it, it must be correct and it, and it can't be biased and, and it must be true and honest and factual. Society, humanity has lost their way. That, that is not the right way for us to move forward. We have to agree. We have to learn and we have to teach that, that as always, what you read and what you hear is not necessarily true. In fact, more often than not, it's not. True. I guess the platforms are protecting themselves from that in a way. What do you think about the, the privacy of information that is withheld from us content creators? right? Like for example, say I post something on LinkedIn. I don't actually know who my views were. If I've had 15,000 views, I have no idea. But if I do an email, right, I know exactly who opened it and I've got access to that data. What's, you know, what's your view on that 
moving from censorship to actually data sharing there a little bit, what's, you know, what do you think about that? Do you think that that's something, if you've said something and you can't get the data again, is your viewpoint the same? Like that's my, that's their platform and they can do as they please. I, I do, but, but for subtly different reasons that I'm not a big fan of the, the legislation that is prohibiting tracking. I'm not a big fan of GDPR and CCPA and some of this other legislation that is that has caused or forced Google Analytics, for example, to change so that we we can't get as much information about uh, people on our website. Why? Because again, that's that's my website, uh, that's my email, that's that's you know I created that, I produced that, I published that. It's on my platform, and and why why could or should any governed entity? prohibit what we can track. Uh, tracking actually enables wonderful, wonderful things. Tracking enables a wonderful experience on the internet. And at the same time, well, that's true of my website or your website, Melanie, and, and, and that email you sent out, or rather, I think it should be true that you should be able to track whatever you want. Yes, if we're using LinkedIn's platform to extend our message, right? If we're producing a video and putting it on our website, I should be able to know everybody who visits my website. But when I put that video on YouTube, YouTube gets to decide whether or not they want to tell me everything about that audience. And, and I really don't have any problem with their decisions because the benefit or the or rather the cost of the massive uh, audience, the massive reach is they're going to retain some of that information for themselves. It makes perfect sense. I get to use it for free. So how else are they going to continue to create value and monetize without knowing a little bit more about those audiences and being able to target those audiences and being able to promote things to those audiences so they can make money. And I can benefit from posting on LinkedIn and, and sharing some content at no cost to me. No, I don't get to know as much, but that's okay. If I want to know more, I keep it on my own experience. Yeah, that's a fair view. Moving then into consumption of media, knowing, you know, yes, there is censorship, there is um, privacy information. So, Moving past all that, where do you see now in media, how will consumer consumption change, evolve? Like, are you, do you see a dynamic of, okay, social media taking more and more or how do you see it kind of between social media, Netflix, how is that going to change to, you know, this new thing called meta and how we're going to experience that? How are you kind of seeing us experience media? as consumers going forward. I love that you wove meta into the question because my, my answer tends to confuse and, and often even kind of frustrate some people. I'll turn it back on you. Uh, give me an example of what on the internet is not social media. That's such an interesting question. You know what I think of that's not social media and I might be wrong, I actually think kind of thought that when I'm browsing the internet, I'm not in social media because I kind of thought social is like where you are interacting. And I don't know if I'm right or wrong, but when you're actually in a social newsfeed or you've got other people, but when I was solo browsing myself because I'm not having a social, because of the word social, because I'm not having a social experience of um, someone interacting with me, I kind of always left them outside and I don't know if that's wrong or right. And some of my clients don't seem to think email, which is a service we enable for them after we've kind of seen what works, is not social media, which I would argue that probably is because you've got the interaction back. I think so. Actually, I think your your distinction is correct too, that that I, I started my career at Yahoo uh, back, back, back when, yes, it was static content in what we called Web1, uh, and that static content was indexed in search engines and 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 you know ultimately Google. And and you're right when I when I Google something that is still a private experience between me and my browser, which by the way is tracking me. But, but it's between me and my browser, and and I end up somewhere, right? It's 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 an index. It's a it's a card catalog in the old library, right? It's how we find things. But but beyond that, almost every experience on the internet now is literally social media. And in fact, that's what what coined the idea, or that's what uh, dawned the idea of not Web One but Web Two. Web Two Point was this recognition that, again, my website, for example, is is literally a social media website because 
on anything I write there, you can reply. It's, it's, it's no different than a post on Facebook that you can reply to. Now, it looks different, right? It's, it's a blog post and comments, but, but that's what social media means, is that the, the, the audience has the ability to reply and engage and share, which is exactly why, too, yes, email is a much more so a form of social media than traditional mail. Absolutely, right? When you reply to me, you don't reply in the thread in a in a letter, right? You send me a letter back. <laughs> and and I can't and I can't share that letter with with millions of people, right? But but an email absolutely does work that way, right? It's just a subtly different user experience. And so social media um, it, it almost touches back on the idea of making sure that people understand the technology and, and educating people properly and socializing these things properly. If you are on the internet, you are on social media. And and the very it's in the word for crying out loud. It's social, meaning what? Meaning not private. If you're on the internet, you are not in private. You are you are out in the world. You are you are you are at the campfire. You're you're in a social space, a social place. Meta Meta is a distraction. Meta is, and I don't mean meta in the case of of just Facebook's branding or rebranding, but but the metaverse in general. Metaverse has been around for close to twenty years in a in a very practical way. We've had we've had the exact same experience that people think about when they think of what Facebook is trying to build with Horizon. Uh, it was called Second Life. Sony had something before that. There's there's absolutely zero, nothing new uh, about the the enthusiasm for the metaverse uh, today. Um, other than the fact that we might wear glasses uh, to experience in 3D, which we call virtual reality, right? And and the fact that it will probably blend with augmented reality, right? Which is our, our ability to see the real world, but in an augmented way. And then we can weave into it this blockchain cryptocurrency question, uh, which is you know, the, the amalgam of those things we're referring to as Web3, because we're definitely evolving into a next generation of, of what the internet is, which includes metaverse and cryptocurrency and NFTs and, and so forth. But when you think about it that way, you really then are able to start to question and wonder, is it really changing that much? Is it all that different? Uh, cryptocurrency is just a different form of currency that has other, other methods of accounting as, associated with it to vastly simplify it. And the metaverse is what? The metaverse is, is, is Second Life, which has been around forever. It's Fortnite, which, which I play every couple of days with my kids. It's, the metaverse is, 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 is just a more experiential version of my website. You know, can you, can you go to seobrian.com and, and have a, an immersive conversation with me? Sure you can. Great. That's a metaverse. <laughs> but, you know, we don't have to be in a completely different world or environment to do that. And even if that's how you think of it, that's been around for decades. Is it like this? Because you said it, you kind of compared it to a video game. Is it like when I keep thinking of it, is it kind of when we used to go to the movies and we used to put those 3D glasses on, right? And I don't know why that keeps coming up in my mind. And it, you kind of remember when the 3D movie was a thing and you're kind of feeling like, oh, wow, you're having this experience and this, you know, things are coming right into you. And I keep relating meta to that kind of experiencing and I don't know if it's wrong or right to think that that somehow I'm gonna experience this kind of because you keep talking about gaming and you know uh, this reality so I keep thinking is that what the, we're trying to get to where we're all in virtual realities but when I think about virtual realities the closest concept that comes to me is that experience when we first walked into a movie theater and you put on your 3d glasses I think we live in a in a short window of time for the past few years and, and for the next couple of years. I think we live in a short window of time wherein a lot of people are going to want to argue with you about the definition because they want their definition to be right. Uh, we especially see this in venture capital and, 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 and with entrepreneurs and startups that, you know, if, if I were to say to you, the metaverse is what World of Warcraft was, uh, a very popular interactive world from 15 years ago. Uh, millions of dollars was spent in there building your avatar and, and playing. If I was to say to you, that is, that is a metaverse, 
there is a large percentage of the population today who will say, no, that's not what it is. That's not what we mean. Uh, the reality is it, it's much more analogous to what you were referring to, that it's it's just the next iteration of our experiences with digital content and the internet. You know, you might think of it this way. If, you know, in this in this metaverse, or are, are in these metaverses, are, are we all going to read the news? Am I, am I really excited to get into a virtual world with a headset on to read the news? No. And, and, but, but, but that will certainly be a part of it because news went from newsprint to websites, to social websites, to social media, right? And so obviously news is going to be a part of whatever our experience is with the metaverse. But are we racing to go live in that world for the sake of news? Am I going to watch a newscaster on a, on a fake VR television, or am I going to watch a movie in in a in a fake world? The, the actual answer is, yeah, I, I might once in a while, but am I going to go live in that environment? No, of course not. It's it's what what's going to happen is we're go- we're simply going to see more and more games emerge that are immersive. We're going to see Fortnite is a great example of it. We're going to see concerts and live music in those worlds. We are going to see film festivals where you can go watch a movie with a bunch of other fake avatars that are sitting around you. Uh, you know, and, and don't ask whether or not I'm wrong. Question whether or not other people are wrong. When they, when they try to define it distinctly and narrow as some specific thing, the fact is that's, that's not correct. The, it, it can be any one of these things from from a, a virtual world that we experience on our laptops to to something we experience on our mobile devices to something we experience in 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 a heads up display essentially it's the iteration from what you're used to on the internet now to a more world based virtual world based version of that and 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 what's that most likely to be it's most likely to be games then sports then yes entertainment and socializing social media which is why facebook went that direction but we're absolutely not going to do everything there uh, that that's that's ridiculous the the notion of you know pixar if you watched pixar's wally the movie wally a long time ago right and and they were flying in space and and all of the humans were kept satiated and happy by just living in these alternate realities and moving around that's never going to happen uh, <laughs> the world outside is a much more beautiful place that makes all the sense. I think there's just experiences that are coming that are going to be unique to the one-on-one experience we had in Web 1.0 to Web 2.0, where we're just interacting. But now we can, it sounds like there'll be a new form of media that we can now immerse ourselves in and maybe experience a little bit more further by actually having VR or wearing glasses that make us have a totally different experience. Maybe if there's an ad playing, you can actually experience and be in the ad itself. Absolutely, a- absolutely, and the and the only distinction of what you just shared, Melanie, is I I would I would caution us all who have voices and work in this space to stop calling it new. It it, it is absolutely not new. We we've, we've been we've been working with this stuff for for two decades, and 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 it's just a it's it's a concern. It's an observation in the sense of when we say it's new, we cause people to think that Facebook and Meta, the company that Facebook rebranded, that Facebook is doing something completely different and and incredible and new, and they're not. In fact, if you've if you've experienced it at all so far through Oculus uh, and Oculus VR, it's it's still a good ten years out of da- out of date from what was being done a decade ago. And and what Microsoft is doing with HoloLens is a good 10 years ahead of where Meta is. <laughs> that that it's, it's, it's dangerous to make people think some of this stuff is new because it causes people to think that, you know, this is revolutionary, it's transformative, and, and, it's, and, it's, and it's really not. It's just, we need to continue iterating it and improving it and making it meaningful to people. Uh, but but trust that there are a lot of people who have been working with it for a long time and who understand it and who know the risks and who know the opportunities. Uh, don't come into it assuming that we're all discovering this for the first time because that's not correct. Do you think with consumption of media, what's the play between, say, if I was to put Netflix to TikTok to LinkedIn uh, and let's throw in Facebook for the sake of it, those four players. And how do you see those four players in the next five years in terms of us and consumption in consuming those channels? 
we've we've talked a few times about the fact that media is the, the media industry at large, the whole the whole of the media industry is in an ever constant push and pull between between the creator and the consumer. That thirty years ago, uh, we had to buy a compact disc in order to get music. Uh, and uh, and the compact disc was f- relatively expensive, frankly, for for what you got. But but that's how how we consumed music. Uh, and and with the dawn of the internet, the pull, the pull was with the dawn of the internet that compact disc turned into an MP3, and the consumer said, "I don't want to buy all of those songs for that much money. And if you're not going to give it to me, I will go find those songs and I will." I will take them, frankly, right? I will take them. Well, but then, then the the industry pulled back, right? Pulled pulled back and said, no, 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 no. All right, hang on. If you guys want to listen to music all the time, we'll we'll do that. We'll launch iTunes, right? We'll launch we'll launch an experience where you could buy the song you want and you can listen to what you want. Well, that wasn't good enough either, right? That wasn't good enough either because the consumer still said, I want whatever I want when I want on demand. And that led to streaming, right? So push, pull, push, pull. And and I share that because Netflix is a victim of the push and pull. And TikTok is a victim of the push and pull. And I mean they're both victims. That that LinkedIn, throwing LinkedIn there in there is a, a an interesting thought because LinkedIn I I I still think is a an incredibly substantially different user experience. But if you just think of of our 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 experience with video, right? Netflix went from the VHS tape to the to the to the DVD to the you can get DVDs on demand to the same experience with the internet. No, actually, I can get whatever movie I want for free. To the movie industry, then saying no, 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 hang on, <laughs> that's that's pirating, right? And so they pulled back, and and and, and so Netflix is a, a bit of a victim, unfortunately, because the studios who own the films finally pulled back and said, no, Netflix, we're not going to let you have all of this stuff. We're going to launch our own experiences. Now, TikTok's actually similar because TikTok is the same as Ible and it's the same as Reels and it's the same as Stories and it's the same that that, that the idea of, of short video with music and with other fun interactive uh, experiences, uh, but there's nothing distinct or u- unusual or unique about that. And so it's, it too is going to suffer from um, the ways in which consumer behavior changes. LinkedIn is interesting, though, because if you think about LinkedIn compared to Facebook, the fact is LinkedIn is a wonderful experience because at the end of the day, it remains professional to an extent. <laughs> it, it will never go to the extreme of TikTok videos uh, <laughs> unless they're professional TikTok videos, right? That, that, that what, what makes LinkedIn distinct and meaningful and, and, and why it will remain so is actually it's more analogous to the studios, to, to the film studios that you, you might not like uh, – Paramount films, but you might like Disney films. You might not like uh, Facebook, but you like LinkedIn, right? See, the, it's the quality, it's the nature of the content that matters. It's it's as you as you referred when we were starting the conversation. It's finding finding the tribe that matters to you. That um, we, the consumer will constantly push to find the tribe that's more meaningful to them, and uh, that will always give the consumer the ability above and beyond what the publisher or the company or the, 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 the studio or the label can do, will always give the consumer the ability to pull things back in our favor, pull things back in our favor. You want to continue to reach us with content? You better figure out how to do it on my terms, not yours. Interesting. With Facebook, what they did for the same similar experience is create groups, you know, and the monitoring of they've got Facebook groups that you can go be part of in LinkedIn, where I don't think we use groups as well because it doesn't come up as a, as so much on our feed and it's sort of not integrated well, whether LinkedIn will evolve into groups, who knows, but yes, you're right. LinkedIn doesn't have a distinct way for us to connect with like-minded people and by job titles or by industry, which is, I guess, what's one of its features and it's one of its features being sales navigator that enables us to sometimes find very distinct people. So you're right. LinkedIn is very distinct, but I wonder with LinkedIn pulling away from stories, it brought in stories, it pulled away from that kind of media channel. It's 
video consumption still, it doesn't really push that as much as every other channel. And it leads me to talk about video. I feel that video content is really, really impactful and all the other platforms being, you know, any other media platforms we're constantly watching video, be it Netflix, be it TikTok. Whereas you see on LinkedIn, their algorithm sort of for a long time, and that slowly changing, didn't enable video experiences. It would rather have us experience a text post or image post and you might say, yeah, that's unique, but some might also say that's kind of backdated as well in terms of moving towards meta, if that's where we're going to go. You would think that you would start bringing in video more into your platform and, you know, enabling those features. But what LinkedIn has done is sort of not gone there. And I don't know if that's because that's what people want or I think is it because they want to push vanity metrics instead because by the time you consume a video, you leave the platform especially busy professionals and your your only thing you've experienced is one thing and then you've left and that means that they can't get everyone else to feel like they got the views and the impressions and all also forth um, is that why they're doing it you know for their own ability to keep users on or is it because video you know that, that's a real question and it's been debated amongst the community um, or is it because why else? Is it that video, everyone else is saying, oh, video is the next thing. It's what people enjoy. It's what the consumer really enjoys. But then we've got impressions and consumption not being pushed by the algorithm for video. So I was, when I was at Yahoo in about 2001, uh, CNET, uh, I don't even know what it stands for, but CNET used to be a major technology brand, consumer net, whatever it is, about the same time. Uh, there was this massive push into video. So 20 years ago, imagine everybody, 20 years ago, there was this massive push into video. And everybody constantly said the same thing. The next big thing is video. Everything's going to be video. It's more engaging. It's more exciting. Why would we not completely transform Yahoo is what they did. They rebuilt the entire homepage of Yahoo to be focused on video. And you know what happened? lost a stupid amount of money and and users and and it was a massive failure and they and they had to revert very quickly that in the early days of the internet with the emergence of streaming and 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 things like Netflix there was this more frequent conversation of what's considered laid back media versus sit up media and laid back media refers to the kind of media that uh, we consume when we sit on the couch I read a newspaper on the couch. I listen to music on the couch. I watch television on the couch. Laid back. Sit up media doesn't work the same way. I don't sit up at my laptop to watch a two hour Marvel film. We just don't do it. Um, I, don't, I don't read a newspaper sitting at my desk, but I will read websites, you see. Um, when it comes to mobile devices, I'll, I'll happily watch two minute clips that are hilarious but I'm, I'm not going to watch a, a half an hour training video on, on a mobile device, right? So in the question and in debate is some of the answer, but also some of the clarity that, that yes, of course, they're doing it for better engagement and better vanity metrics. But why are they doing it for better engagement and better vanity metrics? Because most people aren't on LinkedIn to watch videos. They're just not. Uh, where most people are on LinkedIn to find jobs or as they've proven to read articles, why? Because you're in a professional setting, more likely than not, you're at work, you're in a professional setting. And the easiest thing to do is consume written content. It's also the easiest thing to create. And that's why we know or where we've learned, where we've learned that it's a little misleading to tell everybody that the future is going to be video and everybody should do video. No, most people should not do video. It's expensive. It's hard. You have to you have to look good on camera. You can't pick your nose, right? <laughs> that that it's it, it, where whereas I can write an article in in half an hour and it doesn't cost me anything. I would have to produce that and it would take time and I would have to prepare it and so forth to do the same kind of thing in video. And the difference is I could take the article and put it in thousands of different places, uh, and 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 social media and so forth. The video can only go in a handful of places, and so if the video is the wrong format. Or the, you know, it just it won't work. It's this this very simple notion of what do people do in that environment? I don't TikTok. I'm not a video guy. 
uh, I did radio for a few years when I was when I was in college, and so as people have encouraged me to do video, I keep saying to them, "That's that's I don't that's not my thing. I can get on the air live and talk to you right now if you want, but if you want me to be like." doing a video that looks great and, and make, you know, the cool whiteboard stuff that people do. And it's got awesome animations and that's just not me. I don't know how, and it's not my style. Right. And, and so I think every form of media remains very relevant. And what you want to do as an entrepreneur or creator is you want to find where the, the desired experience suits your personality and your, and, and your, and who you are rather than trying to be something that you're not just for the sake of, of producing other content. That's a really good way to look at it because not everyone enjoys consuming videos, even though I think the younger generation who's coming into the TikTok world seem to really prefer that experience and whether they end up changing once they hit a certain professional point in their life, we don't know. If we knew, we'd all be millionaires, right? Because we'd know exactly where to invest and how that, that consumer behavior is going to work. But See, but I, 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 challenge, I challenge that thought too because before the internet existed, six hours of my day was spent sitting in front of a television. Humans have always read a certain amount of information. We, we, we prefer to listen to information in the car, for example. So, so we will always have demand for audio alone, right? And yes, it looks like younger people are consuming a lot more media. Why? Because we're getting a lot more younger people this stuff. And, and they're using this instead of watching movies for half of the day like they used to do. And so the data, the bias data that's saying, hey, produce more video, everybody, young people are watching more video, is, is just trying to evangelize and socialize the fact that, yes, they are, they're doing more of this than that. It, it doesn't really mean their behavior is changing. It's, it's the format that's changing. Yes, instead of the TV. They still want visual. We still enjoy visuals, like you said. Um, and I agree with you. It is hard to produce video still, but I think there's technology coming on that's going to really enable that more quicker. Like right now, there is things that could be transcribing us right now and formatting while we're speaking and it will just give us snips, two-minute snips that we can just post away. I wonder if also the quality of video consumption, what the expectation is from from people, like whether they're okay with more non-edited, you know, versions of videos without the perfect lighting or whether they expect a certain level of entertainment in it. I I don't know right now. Um, the algorithm likes it when you put authentic videos. That's not from really, you know, it's just you just took it on your phone. The algorithm actually knows that it's not a very, it's a lighter file and it prefers it. But in terms of do we want, what do we want on social media versus I know on Netflix I want a really quality experience, right? Like I want like everything going on. But on social Am I more happy with authentic, authenticity video and almost looks like, I don't know, shabby? Um, I still don't know where that kind of sits at the moment for me because I know how hard it is to produce. So maybe I actually am okay with it if it is a bit shabby here. It's actually, it's more so a, a, an important question to ask of why the algorithm works that way. The algorithm works that way, not necessarily because people prefer it, but because produced video means somebody's paying for it, uh, mean, meaning it's more likely a company or a studio, meaning the social media experience can be charging for it. Right? It's the same. It's the same reason that over the years, if you've been on Facebook for forever, like I have, it's the same reason why engagement on Facebook has plummeted, not because fewer people use Facebook. That's a misleading interpretation. It's because Facebook is intentionally driving down engagement in order to figure out where and when people will pay to get more engagement with their content, right? Same thing's happening with video. It's readily obvious that it's poorly produced or if it's authentic or if it's off a, a, a mobile phone, odds are it's not IBM trying to put out a video uh, about their products, right? And, and understandably, if IBM is doing that, LinkedIn or Facebook wants to say, hey, you know, you, you pay for that. <laughs> but but if it's if it's Melanie or Paul sharing some thoughts, you know, even if we are selling something and we're sharing some thoughts, we're more likely to have a conversation about those thoughts. We're more likely to teach something or share something about those thoughts without as much of a brand associated with it, the corporate brand associated with it. And and so if LinkedIn were to say to us, no, 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 pay for that, well, then we're just gonna stop because we'll go somewhere, we'll go to we'll go to TikTok or we'll go to Reddit, right? We'll just stop and go somewhere else. 
there's a subtlety, there's a subtlety in appreciating whether or not it's because of the user experience, because of what the, the product or platform wants to have happen, or if in fact, indeed, there are genuine uh, good business reasons behind the decisions they're making. And more often than not, they're actually just business decisions. They're, they're, it's actually just somebody saying, look, we make more money if we do this than that. Yes, we track users. Why? Because that way we can serve them better ads. And that's a better experience. I know, you know, it's, 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 there's no in, ill intent behind it. Well, do you know what's funny? For them to do good, actually make money from ads, they have to have creators like us or organic people that are filling in the gaps of the ads because no one wants to be served ads. So in order to make money from the ads, you need to be able to give organic impressions to the right people. So people actually come here and want to create and want to actually give back to their platform so they can actually serve they actually make money from that you know if they don't make the right decisions and they don't put the right content forward they don't they actually take away from good content creators organic then they're actually going to lose out because they want to charge the bigger guys for the ad money but they love it's like kind of you know those shops um you go to and you go i really want from the farm or i want that really authentic experience. I guess you can kind of compare it here. They want those, or people want to see those authentic people. They want to hear stories that are authentic, not just from big brands. So they have to have that organic reach on their platform, but um, including video. And I guess you're right. Maybe they have a way to know that, hey, this is not a top quality from a X camera. Let's actually, you know, put this forward because this is, this is not a paid level. So it's a really smart way to think. And if you and I were like sitting there and we're the executive board of LinkedIn and making decisions, I think we would have lots of objectives um, as, a, as a social media company going, how do we get better content out there? How do we boost that good content? What is good content? How do we even verify what is good content? Is it because it's got X amount of words because someone spent time on it? Is it because it's got X amount of text? I guess they're trying to define all that to try and understand quality that can be then pushed. Yeah, and in my experience, there's much less corporate board decision making about what goals we want to affect because of of the bottom line to make money. There's much less of that than it might seem. That that your point earlier about how Facebook uh, built groups, Facebook built groups. Why? Because it, it's not the right platform. It's not the right environment for long form content for articles. It's just not. Nobody's sitting on Facebook reading articles and reading reading depth of content. And 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 so when you have hundreds of millions of people on your platform, it it makes a little bit of sense to start to enable them to have smaller communities, so that you're not inundated with massive amounts of information. Instead, you can you could find a group about your neighborhood or your company or your passion or or what have you. That made sense. And the challenge, the problem with that, of course, Facebook made a wonderful decision in doing that. But but the problem that then emerged, of course, is tribalism and, and confirmation bias, right? Then, then we find the communities that agree with us. And then even if we're wrong, well, we get, we get validation. Well, LinkedIn, LinkedIn didn't necessarily look at LinkedIn and go, ha, look at that. People aren't likely to watch videos as much. Uh, or, or we, we want more videos because we'll make more money. I think it was a much simpler process of just marketing, of just studying what the market is doing and studying what your competitors are doing. And if you look at Facebook, you go, well, got it. Facebook made kind of a mistake doing groups. We've got groups, but nobody's using them as much. Well, think about it. Why would they? You know, I'm not on LinkedIn to be in my group. And so on LinkedIn, what does work? Long form content. That's why they launched the article experience because newsletters and long form written content is is wonderful in a professional environment. People are used to sitting on their laptop at work and reading some things. And therefore, to your point, there is a format for video that works, right? I'm not sitting on LinkedIn to watch a movie and I'm not sitting on, on LinkedIn to watch TikTok, but there is, there, there's rather obviously, right? They don't have to plan it or study it or program it or force it. There rather obviously is a format to video that makes sense to have on LinkedIn. And I don't think they've entirely figured it out yet. I don't think they're trying to mess with anybody. I think they're just trying to, they're trying to make the best experience they possibly can for, for the sake of what LinkedIn is. And that's going to be different than what Reddit is and what Quora is and, and so on and so forth. I think you're right. I think they are trying to figure it out. And another thing they're trying to figure out is where their new 
ad services, LinkedIn ads, which is very much uh, like a Facebook ad experience, how that's going to sit. And I think ads in general are something that everyone is within TikTok, within LinkedIn, trying to figure out how they're going to, you know, take advantage of ads, including Netflix, I believe, is also now in talks of how they're going to bring in ads. So this new world of ads, because I guess it's been based on subscription, it's they've had other features, but ads is just where I can see, you know, a lot of money was made by Facebook. Um, they've got deterioration now within their ad space because of privacy policy, but all these other platforms I'm are sort of excited that they can like, you know, come in and play within that ad space. So ads seem to be, you know, something that all platforms are evolving to and start trying to think, God, how can we use ads within it? What are your thoughts about advertisement? Do you see that it deteriorates a platform that has been, you know, ad free, or do you think that's just a natural progression of a maturity of a business who are thinking, okay, how do I get more rev channels? into my business. Advertising online is one of my most passionate topics. And I hate, I never use the word hate, but I hate the pace at which governments are trying to prevent advertising through the internet by enforcing or by forcing privacy and eliminating tracking. I hate it. Here's why. You started your your question with Facebook. Well, the reality is Google made billions and billions of dollars before that, proving that ads is right. And Yahoo made billions of dollars before that, proving that ad was right. AOL did it before that. We've, we've known for 30 years that without question, advertising is the single best way to monetize a business online. Why? Because we can track your behavior. And while a lot of people are concerned with that, Take yourselves out of the internet for a second. You start to appreciate why it's so meaningful. When you look around the billboards in your city, how many of those billboards are relevant to you? Or when you're listening to radio in the car, right? And you hear the mattress advertisement and the diamond jeweler advertisement and political advertisement, how much of that is actually meaningful to you? Almost none of it, none of it. And so ads in the traditional world, in the newspaper, in on television, how, how many of us remember television and freaking hated commercials in, on television? Why? Not because we actually hated commercials, but because they were not at all relevant to me. Not at all, right? What the internet made possible is an experience in which, yes, the advertising is actually meaningful. And Google proved that that I could search for something and not only get a series of organic results that might matter, but even the paid stuff is relevant. Even the paid stuff is meaningful to me. And what does that enable Google to do? It enables Google to provide the service at no charge. We can use Google for free. Why? Just by putting up with some ads? I don't have any problem with putting up with some ads. And I like that the ads are better here than they are when I'm driving around in my car. So it's a concern. I hate that governments are getting involved in this. It's of concern because in the last four or five years, we've seen all web platforms struggle more and more with the fact that they can't track people as much, which means what? Which means the ads suck, which means what? Which means now you're upset about them and you, you, you don't like them and, and you're probably going to leave the website and the platform or they need to explore other ways to make money, which means what? Charging you a subscription. Well, I'll tell you right now, I'm not paying a subscription for Facebook. I'm not. I'm not even really going to pay a subscription for LinkedIn. I'm just, it's, there are enough alternatives, right? And so why would we prevent the fact that tracking enables advertising and content and in fact, user experiences, personalizing the entire experience, it enables the entirety of the internet to be a better place. And yes, of course, people are making money with it. Yes, of course, they're using my data. That, that's the point. That, that's why we created the internet, to collect and share data. And so why, why would we prevent that? Why would we start to prohibit that just because people are uncomfortable with it? Unfortunately, we're, for the next five or 10 years, probably into whatever the metaverses are going to be, we're going to see awful attempts, really, really awful attempts to show us ads or to make money in other ways. And they're, and they're so awful 
we're not going to want to use them. We're going to, you'll start to see people complaining. I, I already see people complaining that the advertising is horrible. Yes. You know why it's horrible? Because you, you asked your, your politician to fight tr- tracking and fight privacy. And, and now, now we can't serve you ads that are meaningful to what you want and what you like, because we don't know anymore. Or we're not allowed to know anymore. Do you think that what happened with Facebook, how, you know, now on your iPhone, it goes, it actually asks you, you know, do you want to be served ads or not? And you can say, no, I don't. And you can switch it off. Is it just, um, you know, how soon is it before that is then applied into LinkedIn, TikTok, like the same sort of experience that we have there that we'll be also saying yeah, well, I mean, it, it it will happen pretty quickly because we already seen the same thing with GDPR, right? The European privacy requirement. And, and 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 that's a good example of where we know people are really annoyed. We constantly see everybody saying, why do I have to click the same thing every time on every website when I when I will accept cookies? Can I just click it once? Yes, I'm okay, right? Um, and, 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 and so we know that's a horrible user experience. It's a horrible user experience. The only time people should be asked is when they get on the internet. When you open your phone, are you okay with ads or not? Great. <laughs> when you when you get on your laptop and you open your browser, you can ask once, are you okay with ads? We're going to track you. Is that okay? Yes or no? Right? That's a fine time to do it. Uh, when you go through your internet service provider, right? Maybe you could ask there. But but beyond that, it's it becomes annoying. And 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 I don't think that I don't think that the government's putting this this these limitations in place understand the implications. The implications are that Places that don't require that will win. Countries that don't require it will win. Um, alternatives, competitors will win. Uh, we, we see that, for example, quite a bit with regard to intellectual property and patents and copyrights. China is a place where they don't care at all about intellectual property and patents and copyrights at all. That's their culture. It's not a right or wrong thing. It's just the way things are. You know. And so if you want to continue to fight and say, hey, this is mine and I created it and I own it and it's, you will lose. Because there are people in the world who don't care. They don't care about who owns what, right? That it's it's similar. It's similar in nature. We've got to find a better solution rather than rather than trying to force what society thinks it wants. Because the world was actually a good place when we were all trapped and <laughs> yes. monetized. Yeah. We didn't pay for most of the internet. That was a nice thing. What an intelligent thought. And just if sort of you didn't catch that thought on, it was basically some the countries that are going to enable ads and are going to allow tracking are going to have a better higher gdp is the point that i think we were trying to make because they'll have a more business acumen driven economy and that's the point paul was saying was that by enabling those people to have ads so for example in europe you can't actually do sponsored messaging ads linkedin stopped that because of gdpr so you can't actually message anyone so that particular country their cpc the cost per click when you actually serve to a germany or something is very high because you you don't have that variation to do lots of different things so everyone's bidding on one type of format of ad so when i tried to compete over there i was like wow this is way too expensive so come back into australia usa where we don't have to have the same rules we can start doing a different format it's much more actually easier to grow business and to allow small businesses to even thrive and startups to thrive in those environments. And therefore, we'll have more successful businesses, more tax will be paid by those businesses and those economies will thrive. And I think that is such an intelligent point you made because it really connected something for me. So I thought I would share that. I've never thought of it that way. Thank you for that. But we say the same thing quite frequently in media tech ventures, startup incubators. When you put burdens on the economy with regard to tracking or advertising or or even other forms of of burden, uh, believe it or not, like recruiting policy, policies and, and, and employment policy. When you put those burdens in place, the people who suffer are the entrepreneurs because the big companies can afford it, right? And so all you've effectively done in, in Europe, for example, is you've enabled Nokia or you know, the other big company there to, to own more of that audience and own more of that share of voice. Why? Because they can afford it. And the startup that's trying to get going or to compete with Nokia or to reach that market, they can't afford it. They can't afford it. So you've, you've, you've effectively done nothing for the society other than enabling big companies to more so monopolize the environment. And you've, as you pointed out, Melanie, you've sort of handicapped the quality of the experience overall, which is going to cause the entire experience to fall a little bit behind and cause the local GDP to suffer. 
fewer people will bother spending money. Fewer people will spend time there because I don't want to see the same awful corporate ads all the time, right? And and you end up you end up with a poorer user experience overall, and it's going to disrupt the economy in which you work. So final thoughts. What an enlightening conversation. It's really enlightened me and it's really pushed me to think beyond. So I really appreciate that. What can companies and startups do to prepare for what you know, what the next steps in media are going to be. There are going to be changes. There are going to be slaps on ads. There are going to be, you know, content format experience expectations from users slightly. What what can we advise our startups, our companies, you know, from startups to Series A, what, what can they sort of do to prepare? I, I actually think it's an easy answer, but it's also an answer in which people like to argue with me because they don't understand the definition of these words. Only two things. We've known this for decades. Only two things create value in business. Marketing and innovation. Period. Everything else that you do as a business is a cost. So as an entrepreneur, if you're doing anything but those two things, just know that you are spending money. Even if you're not actually spending money, you are are spending resources without creating value. What creates value is marketing and innovation. That I love to tell the story about technology uh, in a very simple way about the, the candle and how what you need to understand about technology is that the candle, when it's lit, always melts. There's nothing you can do about it. That's what a candle is. And so you can sit there and exist only with candles. And they will all melt one day and you will run out of candles or you will have to do more work to create more candles. Or you, the business person, the startup, might explore what it means to create the light bulb. Might explore what it means to invent what's next, recognizing that if you don't, you will be stuck with what constantly just disappears, constantly. That's the way the media industry works. If you want to continue to do things the way they used to be done, you will absolutely fail. Absolutely fail in time. Invent the light bulb. And and then notice too in the analogy, if you don't then think about the LED or whatever's going to come next, right? You will you will fall behind as well. Uh, that's the way media works. That the way we produce music doesn't work the way that it did 20 years ago. It doesn't. Uh, and the newspaper business, uh, journalists and reporters that might be listening, you you know this. It used to be that a publisher would hire you and pay you to write content because they made enough money off of subscriptions and advertising that they could afford to do that. It does not work that way anymore, and it will never work that way again. And if you're a reporter who doesn't know how to use Twitter and LinkedIn, you are probably not a very good reporter. Yes, I said it. Because people want to connect with you. They want to they want to connect with you personally, right? The industry is going to constantly change. It's going to continue to change. Right? What's next is some sort of metaverse. Should you be in it or not? I don't know. The answer is not yes. Should you be doing video on LinkedIn? I don't know. The answer is not yes. It depends, right? It depends on what's right for you and your business. That's what marketing is. And innovation is the process of embracing and developing whatever's next and new. If as long as you do those two things, you're prepared for what's coming. And if you don't, good luck. <laughs> we'll see you on the other side. Thanks so much, Paul. What a really meaningful, enlightening conversation. I hope that everyone else enjoys it. I would listen to it twice just to get down some of those technical pieces that we covered. Um, I know I will be. So thank you so much. And I'm excited to have more people hear out this amazing, enlightening conversation. Thanks, everybody. It was a great joy. Nice to see you, Melanie. On the other side of the pond, so to speak, if y'all are ever in Texas, look me up and let's go get some coffee, huh? Sounds good. You are listening to Innovative Minds with Melanie Francis. Tune in every Thursday and spark your mind.